I'm Matt Doran. Crime Investigation Australia has told many stories of how dogged investigators and clever forensics have tracked down killers who might have otherwise got away. One of the most intriguing is the tale of an investigation in Western Australia that eventually nabbed a crazed killer, a man from whose hands dripped the blood of little children. This is the Brand Highway, winding north along the Western Australian coast, from Perth to the port city of Geraldton, 400 kilometres away. Geraldton is a modern, friendly city, best known for its substantial fishing industry. And just to the south is the quaint, historic hamlet of Grenoff, one of the first settlements in the west. It's Monday morning, February 22nd, 1993. A man and his wife are on their way to visit a friend, Karen McKenzie, who lives with her three children in an isolated house outside Grenoff. They've arranged to help Karen with some home repairs. Watch your speed. The couple are very close to Karen, and have spent many happy times with her and her children. Just outside Grenoff, they turn into a side road. As they approach the house, they see what appears to be a body on the ground. Confused, the man stops the car and gets out to investigate. And sees it's the dead body of a youth. This is a moment that will stay with the couple for the rest of their lives. For, as they'll oh soon God. find out, they've come across only one of the victims of a ghastly mass murder. The peaceful coastal city of Geraldton sits on the edge of the vast state of Western Australia. It's a prosperous community, drawing its wealth mainly from farming, mining, tourism and especially lobster fishing. 20 kilometres to the south along the highway to Perth is the little pioneering village of Grenoff. It's here in the early 1990s that 31-year-old single mother, Karen McKenzie, comes to make a home for her three children. Teenager Daniel, who's just turned 16, and two little girls, Amara, who's seven, and Katrina, aged five. Her friends know her as a very happy, friendly, bubbly type of person, willing to offer a helping hand to anyone in need. Karen's mother, Barbara Marchant, remembers that even as a child, she was bright and cheerful. She was full of life. She was always laughing. Very good at school. She loved music. She loved nature. She loved plants. She loved being outside. And really, that is about all that she was ever interested in, her music and, and being outside and getting to see things, knowing things, learning things didn't matter what it was. But Karen also develops a rebellious nature. She experiments with recreational drugs and then suddenly she falls pregnant. She has Daniel when she's barely 15 and is quite unprepared for motherhood. So the boy is raised by Karen's mother in Queensland. Karen's sister, Evelyn, says her sister had tried to cope as a teenage single mother. I think it was about when she was about five months pregnant, she moved out of home and um, moved into a unit and was trying to make a go of it on her own. She did try and look after him, but I think she found it very hard. So she asked me to take him. So I took him when he was just before he was two years old. And I had him until he was 16. At 24, she meets a man named Andrew Allen, with whom she settles down and has the two girls but it doesn't last and the couple separate. Karen can just afford this run-down weatherboard house at Grenoff. She seemed to do everything in the house and she was trying to build it into a nice home for them. And it was on a piece of land. 
She always had the dream of having a hedgerow of baronia. Crime reporter Helen Winterton says Karen was a good mother. Karen had had a tough life, but she was doing as best she could. She, um, she certainly mixed in circles or groups of people who use drugs, and I think um, that's one of the things this story highlighted was the use of drugs in, in this area. Um, but she loved her kids, and I think while on one side she was streetwise and having a good time, she was also doing the, trying to do her very best for the kids. Seven-year-old Amara attends a local primary school where teachers remember her as a sweet and happy child. Now that Karen's more settled, Daniel arranges to come to live with her and the girls. Uh, Daniel had been living with his grandmother over east and had only recently joined Karen in Geraldton. And from all accounts of, by all accounts of her friend, from Karen's friends, Karen was really excited that Daniel was coming. She was, she was really looking forward to involving him in Amara and Katrina's life and, and maybe making him the man of the house. Oh, I suppose it was about a month before his birthday. He said, I really do want to go and see Mum. I said, all right, well, I guess your birthday present will have to be a coach ticket to Western Australia, won't it? And that's what I did. Bought him a ticket that went the next day. Daniel was enrolled in high school at Geraldton. When he was growing up, it was really hard to get him to go to school. <laughs> he just, he never wanted to go to school. He was a bugger. And, um, but when he went over there, he actually, he enrolled back in school, which I thought was amazing. And he actually said he was going to go through and finish grade 11 and 12 and make a go of it. And I was so proud of him. Although Karen McKenzie is getting her family life organised in Greenough, her love life is still in some turmoil. By February 1993, her latest serious relationship with a boyfriend has just ended, although it seems she's not sure what went wrong. On Valentine's Day, she sends him a bunch of roses and attaches a poem saying goodbye. And I didn't know who it was from when I first got it because there's no name on the card, but everyone knows, yeah, it was Karen. It was the writing and all that. And just in the corner of the card, it's got boy. So, like, she knew something was going to happen, but she just didn't tell no one nothing. She just bottled it all up. <laughs> on Friday, February the 19th, 1993, with Daniel able to babysit the little ones, Karen goes off to a private party in Geraldton. She stays until around five o'clock on Saturday morning and then gets a lift home with a friend. As the party guests wave her goodbye, none of them can know that less than 48 hours from now, she'll be involved in a horror that will change their community forever. Thanks for coming. Sure, we can. Do you want to go to the park? Yeah? Do you want to play any card games? We can play some cards. It's 1993. Single mother Karen McKenzie has settled outside the village of Grenoff, near Geraldton, on the Western Australian coast. It's a weatherboard house set back away from the main highway at the end of a side road. She has two little daughters and has recently been reunited with her teenage son, Daniel. It's about 3 a.m. on Monday morning, the 22nd of February, 1993. At the isolated farmhouse, all is quiet. All but Daniel are asleep. Slowly, quietly, a car approaches.
A light goes on at the kitchen window. Daniel comes out, curious to see who could be arriving at this time. The driver gets out of the car and approaches Daniel. Suddenly, without warning, Daniel is attacked and knocked to the ground. The attack is so brutal and shocking that a court order has banned anyone from ever revealing exactly what happened. Now certain the youth is dead, the killer turns his attention to the house. He walks slowly towards the back door. Inside, Karen is asleep on the lounge room floor. He sneaks across the room and stands above her. He lifts a tomahawk and slashes it down into her head. She rolls over, her body contorting into spasms until she lays still. Her body half naked in a pool of blood. He walks into Karen's bedroom, rummaging through cupboards and drawers in a search for drugs. He finds hand lotion and walks back to Karen's lifeless body. He then covers her battered head with a blanket and leaves her body crouched, kneeling on the floor. Next, he walks slowly to little Amara's bedroom, where the seven-year-old is sound asleep. She's brutally attacked and killed. The Supreme Court of Western Australia has ordered that all the details of the attack be kept secret. With three members of the family now horribly executed, the only one left alive in the house is tiny five-year-old Katrina, who is still asleep in her bed. Mercifully, she dies quickly. Covered with blood, he walks to the bathroom. washes the blood from his arms and legs and wipes them dry with a rag. Then, being very careful not to leave any clues, he picks up the tomahawk and the hand lotion, walks calmly to his car and drives away. It's now mid-morning, February the 22nd, 1993. The married couple are on their way to meet Karen. When they drive up and see a body lying on the ground, they think at first it's simply the teenager, Daniel, playing some sort of prank. But when the husband gets out and takes a closer look, he can't even be sure that it is Daniel wasn't the Daniel I'd met the week before and looked nothing like him. It's very hard to describe what he looked like. In shock, he steps slowly and quietly around the body and moves towards the back of the house. At the back door, the family dog starts barking. He calls out to Karen but there's no reply. Let's go get the cops, let's go get some help. Now his terrified wife can take no more and screams to him to return to the car. He runs back to her and they speed back up the road. I went back to two houses along her main drive on the paddock and tried to, I jumped the fence and tried to make contact with people in those houses and there was nobody home in either of those houses. I then went out onto the main gravel road where you come in, tried a house there, and there was no one there either. So I went back down the main gravel road over the highway to the Greenough, Greenough Pottery Museum or Pottery House on the right hand side to the museum and asked for their help to ring the police and inform them of a murder. 
It's not long before a crack team arrives. They are detectives from the Geraldton CIB, along with uniformed officers. It's about 11 o'clock and hot. Forensic officer Bryn Jones is on the team. We knew uh, from what had been told that the young boy was uh, lying on the dirt track just outside the house. We also knew that uh, there were other members of the family living with the boy, so uh, our, our immediate concerns were for the welfare of the rest of the family. Uh, and so we, we um, raced into the scene and found uh, the young boy as described on the driveway. We didn't know if the offender was still in the vicinity. We didn't know where the rest of the family was. Detective Merv Cousins is first to enter. The first thing he sees is a terrible mess with clothing strewn all over the room. Mate, she's over there, check her. In the lounge room, in one corner, is Karen's crouching, naked body, her head still covered with the blood-soaked blanket. She's dead. In the bedrooms, they find the bodies of tiny Amara and Katrina. Detective Bryn Jones will never forget that day. Without a doubt, the uh, most horrific crime scene I've ever had the misfortune of examining. I, I can remember one thing very, very clearly. One of the detectives turned me and said, well, what do we do now? And uh, my immediate response was, I don't care what we do, but we must find the person that did this. Isolated house at Grenoff, near Geraldton, north of Perth, is the scene of an almost unimaginable brutality. Hello. Early on a Monday morning in February 1993, Karen McKenzie and her three children have been attacked and killed. It's a scene such as none of the experienced police have seen before. The horrified officers take time to compose themselves before the house and the surrounding area are secured. They alert the major crime squad in Perth, requesting more detectives to assist in the investigation. It's hot and windy, and evidence such as footprints and tyre marks need to be preserved quickly. So these sorts of conditions can have uh, quite significant effects on the detectable life of forensic evidence. So. One of my initial uh, steps to take was to try and preserve, record and, and recover any vulnerable evidence from outside the crime scene. Police can only speculate at this stage as to why Daniel's body is outside the house. Had he tried to escape from the house and been caught? I took uh, numerous photographs outside the crime scene, both of a general nature to depict the story of uh, what had taken place outside and also some more um, evidence-specific photographs uh, relating to uh, shoe impressions, tyre impressions and um, some items of evidence which were located near the deceased. The media is informed and a press conference is held. There's a 30-odd-year-old woman, a 16-year-old boy, and uh, two young girls aged between three and six. The house and surrounding area have been cordoned off as forensic police search for any clues which may lead to the killer. Reporter Helen Winterton recalls her shock when she inspected the crime scene. Inside the house you actually saw everything that made this, these people a family, all the, all the little notes of what to do that night at school, um, drawings on the fridge that the kids had done. Um, really brought home the fact that Karen loved her children, was a loving mother just like any other mother and that this had been a family unit before the murder had taken place. I just remember looking around the room and there were her little dresses hanging up in this tiny little child size wardrobe and her toys and it was the contrast of, of the absolute hell that had taken place in that room with the day-to-day trappings of being a little girl. 
A big team of detectives then embarks on the long, painstaking task of searching the house. They spend all day and much of the night gathering every scrap of evidence to be packaged and tagged. By 4am on Tuesday, the bodies are removed and flown to Perth for the post-mortem examination. The exhausted team finally leaves to get some rest, putting a guard on the house of horrors. But they are back on duty at 7am, bringing with them uniformed police and SES volunteers to comb through the surrounding scrubland. The work will go on for seven long days and nights. Three days into the examination of the crime scene, detectives start the search for fingerprints. A palm print particularly interests them. There was a, a, an area of palm print developed on this side of her right hand, right hand palm. And that was detected using um, a method called iodine fuming, where iodine chemicals are uh, uh, heated up and the fumes are applied to the surface, which in turn react with the fat content of a person's, natural fat content of a person's uh, fingerprint or palm print deposit. The detectives photograph the palm print and then actually cut it out of the wall to make sure it's preserved. In those days, we didn't have the luxury of digital cameras where we could capture the images of the palm print, check the images for clarity to see if the necessary detail for comparison was present. Uh, it was captured with uh, just 35 mil wet film cameras. The forensic team then bring in the special ultraviolet polylight to rescan every surface. A polylight has an extremely powerful beam and its various coloured filters expose different substances that can't be detected by the naked eye. And during the examination of the room where the palm print was originally found, we also uh, detected some greasy marks on the same door, on the inside of the door, which uh, fluoresced quite, uh, quite well under ultraviolet light. The door is removed from its hinges and sent to fingerprint experts in Perth for further study. The man who gets the job of examining it is Dr John Challoner, the principal research chemist at the Western Australian Chemical Centre. We'd heard, first of all, that it was, a, it was possibly a sorbolene cream, um, which is a fairly common sort of hand cream. Uh, so, as I said before, we characterise the, chemically characterise this particular body lotion and uh, compared it with, with the 80 or so body lotions in our, our library. The closest match they can find is with a well-known brand of hand lotion, but it's not an exact match. The team is also puzzled as to why they can't match it with the various creams and body lotions seized from the house. They can't know the killer took this particular substance with him. And then, in addition to trying to get the exact chemical composition of the substance in the prints, there's a second hurdle. The prints aren't full fingerprints, only fingertips. They're the extremities of the three fingers, fingertips on the inside of the door, as if someone had pushed the door closed and had the contaminants on their fingers at the time of doing so. And the surface of the door is also making it hard to get a clear image of the prints. The door was uh, hand painted and it had been painted with a quite a coarse brush and, and the brush strokes of the paint were interfering with the ability to see the fingerprint ridges. So uh, a soft software uh, enhancement package was used to remove those brush strokes from the images so that the fingerprint ridges could be clearly seen. It's while they're battling to get clear prints that the investigators begin to wonder why the prints came to be made in this oily substance in the first place. In previous cases we've been involved in assaults where these, this type of cream has been used uh, as a lubricant. So I then got in touch with the pathologist uh, to find out if, if any uh, Swabs have been taken from the, the bodies, and uh, particularly anal and vaginal swabs. And they had, fortunately. If it can be shown that they are made of exactly the same oily substance as that found on Karen's body, then that would directly link the owner of the prints to the murders. 
Chalana only has minuscule amounts of the oily substance to work with, and the work is time consuming, exacting, and for its era, groundbreaking. Well, it's the chemical composition of the, the swabs, of the, of the uh, body lotions, uh, which was determined by a technique that um, I'd specialised in, a chemical derivatisation technique. Uh, which really allowed us to work with uh, very small quantities of material, which uh, previously hadn't been possible to do. The massacre is now big news, and police lines of inquiry multiply with every phone call. WA police chiefs decide to set up a full task force led by the man who first entered the house, Detective Merv Cousins. They appeal for anyone who might have any information to contact a 1800 number. And they issue video footage of a Christmas wish list and a Mother's Day card. Katrina wanted a troll for Christmas. Trolls were the toys for Christmas that year. And um, Amara had written her mum Mother's Day cards and Mum, I, I hope you have a great Mother's Day. Just the innocence of those two, they were, they were just looked like the most beautiful little children um, that you could ever meet. We did a house-to-house um, -house check at the beginning of the inquiry. The neighbours were all very cooperative and they also knew the family. Um, we knew that the person that committed these crimes had to know how to get into Karen's property because her address is, you, you don't come in off um, the Great Northern Highway, it's actually coming in off the side street, but it's a fair way in. So um, the offender had to have been there before to, to, to know where to go. Karen's de facto husband, Andy Allen, is quickly located in the north at Halls Creek, where he's been trapped for some time as heavy rain has made all roads in the area impassable. He has a rock solid alibi. Some witnesses say they saw two vehicles at the house on Sunday, and so detectives then wonder if the attack was some sort of gang revenge execution. Karen was a small time drug user, but she associated with a lot of people in the drug field, and that sort of also included our, uh, in our list of suspects, uh, people in the drug industry. Uh, we looked at um, bikies, and we looked at uh, the Asian connection. There were some Asian people there in the drugs. Also to be interviewed are the guests at the party Karen attended on the Friday night before the murders. First on the list is 24-year-old Bill Mitchell, the man with whom Karen got a lift home from the party on Saturday morning. He's a farmhand and a small-time drug user who had a heated argument with Karen at the party. Yeah, everyone was having a good time until an argument broke out over a certain few things there. And What's my problem? Yeah. You've been ignoring me the whole time. That's my I problem. I have not been ignoring you. When I walked in the door, I went, hello. Oh, come on. We're mates, all right? Don't always been mates and don't touch me. Touch Pretty much after that settled down, I just wanted to decide to leave because I don't like argumentative drunken parties. <laughs> Bill and Karen left the party at about five o'clock on Saturday morning and drove the 25 kilometres to her home. Bill then left her house at around 11am and a neighbour confirms seeing his car leaving. Next to be added to the list is a man who used to live at the house. He admits to police that he telephoned Karen McKenzie at 11.15 on Sunday night. He has no firm alibi, saying he went to bed soon afterwards. Karen's former boyfriend also becomes a person of interest when police learn of the recent breakup. All these men give fingerprints and samples of their blood, saliva and hair. Before the hunt is over, more than 70 persons of interest will have samples taken. Senior police also have some semen samples from the crime scene. But this is 1993 and DNA technology is still quite primitive. We did have a, uh, uh, a very early DNA analysis capacity, but it was limited to only one loci which essentially meant that uh, it didn't have sufficient discriminatory powers to, 
to suggest that uh, the semen belonged to a particular person. It was more used in those days in conjunction with, with blood grouping to eliminate people or to suggest that a person could not be eliminated as the donor. But while the blood grouping rules out some people, new leads keep coming in. And there's one person detectives now start to look at more closely. The investigation into the brutal murders in Western Australia of Karen McKenzie and her three children is producing multiple leads. We did um, Australia's Most Wanted and as a result of that we identified the location of one of our suspects. He was in South Australia. Um, the South Australian police actually interviewed him and verified his alibi. On Friday, March the 5th, several weeks after the murders, the funeral is held for Karen and her three children. The full horror of the slaughter of innocents comes home and townspeople and school children gather to grieve and pay their respects. Daniel's high school friends form a guard of honour. They let us see them. There was the school children there from Hamar and Katrina's school. They played the rose for Karen, because Janice Joplin used to be her favourite singer. And we played Daniel for Daniel. And the children had a poem written about him. I wanted whoever had done it found. And that's what carried me through. Whatever I could do, I did to find him. I travelled all over the place around Western Australia talking to people myself. But the police were wonderful. They did a really good job. Such is the town's revulsion over the crime that even drug users and drug offenders talk openly to the police. Information comes in about a fisherman who had been seen speaking to Karen on Sunday morning in Geraldton and had then left for Darwin the day after the killings. The Darwin CIB tracks him down and finds he has no alibi for the time of the murders. Meanwhile, there's a brief breakthrough when the palm print taken from the bedroom wall is found to match the hand of Bill Mitchell. But Bill was a friend of Karen and he visited the house on a number of occasions, including the day before the murders. His are just some of the many fingerprints found at the house. The police then get a dramatic phone call from the host of the party that Karen McKenzie attended in Geraldton two days before she was murdered. The party host reports that his home has just been broken into and that there's a large quantity of blood on the floor. Whose wallet is it? Police rush to the house and find car keys Mitchell's. and a wallet belonging to Bill okay. Mitchell. Has he too been murdered? Then, suddenly, Bill bursts in. <laughs> He's naked, except for a towel, and dripping with blood. He tells them how he arrived here at the door of the house, where three men suddenly appeared and dragged him inside. Where he was, so they cut me up! The men told Bill they knew that the party host committed the Granoff murders and demanded Bill tell them where they could find the man. Where is he? Call someone! Bill says he told the gang he didn't know where the host was and they then took a filleting knife and tried to sever his penis. He managed to struggle free and lock himself in the bathroom. He says when the attackers left, he ran outside and hid in the yard until he saw the police arrive. At Geraldton Regional Hospital, Mitchell admits to police that his story is a complete fabrication. All he'll say is that he tried to kill himself. He's then charged with making a false statement. 
It soon emerges that he had committed the self-mutilation at a coastal caravan park just south of Geraldton. A cleaner discovered an on-site van splattered with blood and semen. Also found in the van was a pornographic magazine that had been slashed to pieces with a razor blade. Park owner Bernie MacArthur immediately called the police. The thought ran through my mind, well, there was the murders up at Greenough a short time prior to that, and the offender hadn't been arrested at that stage. Could be involved, may not be. Uh, so I rang the local police. They came down and uh, took away the plastic bag with all the things in it. The incident, which eventually proved critical, is not released to the media. Bill Mitchell is obviously emotionally unstable, but there's still nothing to link him to the killings. In fact, he continues to show great interest in the investigation and concern about the death of his friend Karen and the children. Meanwhile, in Perth, chemist John Challoner is still trying to identify and match the oily substances. And because the prints they've isolated are only fingertips, police have to revisit all the suspects. They were asked to volunteer them. They weren't under arrest. And um, that required uh, me to then actually capture the fingertips, fingerprint impressions from the suspects. There are at least 25 persons of interest who'd have to be reprinted, including Mitchell. Detective Bryn Jones interviews him at the farm where he works in nearby Morrowa, and Mitchell suddenly makes a comment that sends a chill down the detective's spine. During the uh, process of taking Mitchell's inked fingerprints for comparison purposes, he said to me, I'm surprised you're still going on with this investigation, I thought you'd caught the bloke who did this. I heard that he was kept, I heard in the press that he was behaving really strangely in some caravan park and you caught up with him. So that immediately rang alarm bells and as I said it just sent a chill down my spine so I knew that only the killer could have known that. The detective realises that Mitchell, by linking the bloody caravan park incident to the murderer, was actually naming himself as the killer. A fresh set of Mitchell's fingerprints are rushed to Perth and word soon comes back that they match those found at the murder scene. I can remember getting off the phone, gathering my thoughts for a couple of seconds and then tracking down Merv Cousins. Everybody was in my ear, said, what was that, what was that, what was the result? I said, I want to speak to Merv. And I, I found Merv and I said, uh, Merv, the fingerprints on the back of the door have been identified to Mitchell. I can remember him slapping his hand on the desk and said, right, we got him. Then, the final breakthrough. Chemist John Challoner announces that the oily substance samples from the prints and Karen's body are chemically identical. It's absolute proof Mitchell was present at the murders. Mitchell continues to be kept under close surveillance at the farm at Morrowa. All the while, he's playing the part of a normal, conscientious employee. A hard worker, um, knew what he was doing knew exactly what he was doing. He didn't have to go around and keep an eye on him. The type of bloke you'd bring into the kitchen and just about wash his dishes afterwards, that type of bloke. Mitchell even chats calmly to his boss about the murders. Well, while we were in the shearing shed, um, we actually talked about the murders. Um, told him what we thought they'd do to, should do to the person. They ever catch him. And... After spending nearly five weeks hunting down the Mackenzie's killer, Geraldton detectives were forced to leave him on the loose for another two nights. Senior police in Perth decided they wanted to make the arrest themselves in this high profile murder case. During an interview, he is confronted with Challoner's evidence linking his prints to Karen's body and he coldly confesses to the murders. Persistent, tireless investigation has finally produced a breakthrough in the Grenoff murders. 
Bill Mitchell's palm and fingerprints left at the house have been conclusively linked to hand lotion found on Karen McKenzie's body. But even with all the evidence before them, the police are still unprepared for the whole shocking truth as Mitchell, step by step, tells them exactly what happened. On Sunday, February the 21st, the day after he'd left the party house in Geraldton with Karen, Mitchell was back at the same house. He was drinking heavily and smoking marijuana. He swallowed a handful of prescription pills and twice went into the toilet where he injected himself with amphetamines. Mitchell stayed there late into Sunday night and then at about 2.30 on Monday morning, he left Geraldton and drove to Greenough. By now, he was in a drug fueled stupor. He drove up to the house and immediately struck down Daniel. He then went into the house and killed Karen before her. He searched drawers and cupboards for drugs and then went to the children's rooms and attacked the little girls. Mitchell went through and methodically and clinically described uh, everything that he had done with sh without showing any emotion, without showing any remorse. He described the acts he had carried out, murdering the victims, just like he might describe how he washed his car yesterday. It was that clinical and that uh, free of emotion. It was, it was quite bizarre. Mitchell then told police how he left the murder scene, carefully making sure he took with him the evidence, the weapon and the hand lotion. He drove back to Geraldton, stopping along the way to throw the tomahawk into a river and later disposing of the hand lotion in a rubbish bin. The following day, uh, police divers were dispatched and uh, we found the murder weapon in the, in the area where uh, Mitchell had described and um, even that was a chilling event when the axe was recovered. This is five weeks after the event, the axe was recovered in the muddy riverbed of the Greenough River and when it was recovered and passed on to myself, uh, the physical evidence was still there. There were still hairs adhering to the head of the axe. In his confession, he admits to police that he went to the house determined to kill the family but insists he cannot remember why he wanted them all to die. And yet he has perfect recall down to the smallest detail of everything he did that terrible night. Outside the Geraldton court, the van carrying the man charged with the murders had to pass through an angry crowd of about 300 townspeople. In September 1993, Mitchell pleaded guilty to four counts of willful murder, three counts of indecently interfering with a dead body, and several unrelated counts of armed robbery using a syringe and a knife. Justice Neville Owen said the crimes were so serious as to almost defy description. He said it was difficult for a person having any semblance of ordinary humanity to conceive how such a callous and brutal collection of crimes could be committed by a human being. Significantly, the judge found the killings to be premeditated. He rejected any defence based on Mitchell's intoxication and drug use and noted the absolute clarity of Mitchell's recollections in his confession. He said Mitchell had obviously been able to think and to reason with precision during the killings. William Patrick Mitchell was sentenced to 20 years life imprisonment with strict security and sensationally allowed the right to apply for parole at the end of that time. Justice Owen said the decision to grant that right was the most difficult he had ever made. I was angry because it didn't seem fair. He'd taken four lives. What's 20 years? He'd have only been 44 if he gets out. 
Plenty of time to do some more damage, isn't it? Kill somebody else's family. I wasn't impressed at all. The idea that he could be freed in 2013 caused an immediate outcry, and the government was pressured to try to have the judgment changed. The Crown launched an appeal, and the parole ruling was overturned. Mitchell would be jailed for the term of his natural life. We made sure there was an appeal for never to be released, which is what we wanted. And we got it. But then came another twist. Mitchell appealed to the High Court, which reinstated his right to apply for parole in 2013. The High Court ruled that Judge Owen was right. It was impossible to say in 1993 whether or not Mitchell would still be a danger to the community in 20 years' time, once his sentence was served. Tell me why, why can a criminal get the last chance of appeal? Why could we not appeal it again? Why did he get the last say? And, oh, look, I don't want to be in jail for life. I only want 20 years. Why, why is that right? How can that be right? What about the families that have to live with if this person ever comes out? And technically, according to the judges that made the decision, I think it was two to one, technically the first judge did nothing wrong, technically. Can I ask you uh, what you think of the sentence? Mitchell's barrister, Robert Lindsay, explains. The term of natural life imprisonment should be reserved only for those who are incorrigible or irredeemable in the sense that they was so innately evil or that uh, there was no prospect at any stage of rehabilitation. Uh, our argument was that uh, Mitchell didn't fall within that category. It wasn't as if he was a serial killer or something of that kind. Uh, the expert evidence was that if freed from his drug addiction, and it was found that he, he was a drug addict at that time, he wouldn't constitute, if freed from that drug addiction, uh, a continuing a danger uh, sexually or, or physically uh, to the community. The Greenwich massacre so horrified the nation that it sparked renewed demands for the return of the death penalty in Western Australia. A petition was presented to state parliament demanding death for mass murderers like Mitchell. Well, um, four people are dead and you can never replace those people. Bill's living his life in prison uh, 20 or 30 years and he'll be out. Uh, I think you could make your own judgment on that. I, uh, I'd rather not comment further. My view is bringing back the death penalty for people that admit what they've done so uh, terribly. And that's my personal view. He should be staying there forever until he dies. He should never be let out. Did anybody force him to go out there and kill four people, then go and hide the, some of the things that would have been what made it easier for them to find him? No. When arrested for the Grenoff murders, Mitchell did finally admit to police that Karen McKenzie had refused his sexual advances when he took her home on Saturday after the party in Geraldton. But what did they argue about at the party on Friday night? And how could a simple refusal of sex have led to such a cold, horrible attack on an entire family? I believe that his motive was that he, he didn't like to be knocked back for sexual favours um, by Karen. Uh, and um, I think that he's had his nose put out of joint for that. Uh, he tells us that he was influenced by drugs, but um, I don't think that's an excuse at all. He wasn't that drunk and he wasn't that drugged. If he could drive all that distance, kill four people and drive back and hide the evidence as well. All the men and women who took part in the investigation of the Grenoff massacre were praised for their efforts. Special mention was reserved for team leader Merv Cousins, forensic investigator Bryn Jones and research chemist Dr John Challoner. Constable Bryn Jones did an excellent job. He was uh, one of the first men on the scene with, with uh, Detective Sergeant um, Cousins and he knew exactly where to go and what to do. Uh, I know that he worked 24 hours straight, uh, just making sure that everything was in place. But amidst the praise for a job well done, there were also the long-term effects of the horrors of the case on the lives of the police involved. 
these were guys um, who had young families themselves and children aged either Danny's age or as young as Katrina and Amara. And you often hear and you think it's a cliche that officers have children of their own and but they, these guys were actually upset by what they had seen in that house. And on top of that, they were working incredible hours and going without sleep. It was an incredibly stressful job for them. And I know that even after the investigation ended, some of those guys were never themselves again. And I suppose it would be hard to recover from something like that. Throughout my uh, 20 six year police career, I've never worked with a more professional group of individuals and uh, I've got no doubt that because of their resolve, professionalism and the effort they put in over the course of the uh, first five weeks of the investigation, uh, if it hadn't been for their efforts, um, along with the forensic investigation and the results, that, that perhaps that um, we wouldn't have had such a positive result. Why? That's all I want to know is why? Why get a young woman and three children? Why? Why would you want to do that? Thank you. Well, he's not only hurt me, he hurt my daughter and my son that's too. I've got one son that's still seeing a psychiatrist. How many years do we have to suffer for what he did? Debate has raged for years over Mitchell's sentence, his use of drugs at the time of the murders, and whether he and other mass killers should be offered the possibility of parole. The people of Geraldton live with the memory of the Grenoff massacre, and their state MP, Ian Blaney, is in no doubt as to their views on rehabilitation. It comes down to a couple of issues, and I think one is, are some crimes so bad that that person deserves to go inside and stay there? Then the other argument it sits around rehabilitation, and can they be rehabilitated, and can you take the risk of releasing them out into the community? Because drugs are still freely available, obviously. Um, and to what degree can you excuse him because he was affected by drugs at the time? Well, I know in my community, people would nearly all say, no, he should stay in there for the rest of his life. And there was no role for excusing him because he'd taken drugs beforehand. After serving 20 years, William Mitchell became eligible for parole in 2013, but his repeated applications every three years to be freed have been refused. Finally, a new law banned Mitchell from being granted parole until at least 2025. Even then, Mitchell's parole hearing can be deferred for another six years at the discretion of Western Australia's Attorney General. Mitchell is one of several mass murderers and serial killers who fall under new laws. The change came after the people of Geraldton approached Ian Blaney. The three-year parole hearings have been traumatic, forcing everyone affected to relive the pain of the Grenoff massacre. What it meant for the people who knew these kids and just people in the community who were really, really horrified by what had happened was it meant that probably between six and 12 months out, they'd start worrying about it and have to start preparing paperwork if they wanted to present a case against it. They'd, get, they'd relive the whole thing again, and then they'd have to try and put that to the back of their mind, knowing that in three years time, they've probably got to do the same thing again. Karen's sister, Evelyn Clough, welcomed the new law, saying she's spent years fighting against Mitchell's parole bids. And she swears that as long as Mitchell is alive, she will do whatever she can to make sure he is never released. He took my sister, he took my nephew, and he took my nieces. My sister was only 31. 
to, and who, who, who attacks children? But oh God, I wish she was still here. <laughs> she deserved so much more <laughs> than what happened to her. She fought so hard through her life to achieve what she achieved. He had no right to take it from her. 